Greetings, darklings, from across the interweb. It is once again I, the Duchess Precious Ken, here with the Sounds and Shadows podcast, and I I got a big one today. I got an exciting one. Before we get to it, I do have a quick unboxing. When people send me things, I put them on the show and talk about them. This is so freaking cool. So my friend uh, Rex Arcana, uh, who does Static TV and uh, Rex Arcana Promotions, had made of a lot of the bands over there in the industrial scenes, Magic the Gathering style cards of bands and sent them over. Morris Black, uh, Orange Sector, um, Red Meat, Roan Letterman, a lot of our friends, they're on here and they have these cool cards with a little information about them. They're available on his website. So freaking cool. It is my dream to get my own Magic the Gathering card. I'm going to put that uh, on my actualization life goals. So check that out. And we're going to have an interview with uh, Rex coming up soon. So without further ado, this one's a big deal for me. Um, I was in the goth scene coming up and growing up and got to college. And I have always been a silly, silly goth. You know, I, we do our songs about ninjas and ass play and whatnot. And I heard this in college and it really opened up for me that this style of music can be fun, can laugh at itself, can be satirical and enjoy itself. It is my extreme pleasure to introduce to all of you and have on the show, Aurelio Voltaire. Welcome. Greetings. Welcome. Thanks for having me on board. I'm going to I'm going to try not to squee during this one and just get right into it. It's great to have you here. Um I can't wait to talk about you have a new album out. Um before we do that though, I don't know, maybe maybe a lot of other people didn't grow up and are new to the scene and didn't have this. I like to ask the question to start off with there was a moment when uh a, a young man was at a show, heard a, an album, did something where the dark hand of the prince reached down to you and showed you this scene and this style of music is me. And how did you find yourself into this and find that this was the style of music that spoke to you? Well, I had loved Monsters. I was a monster kid and I had loved monsters and the macabre since I was a toddler, honestly, like as far back as I can remember. And did you have like a also... widow's peak as a baby or something? Or that? did you have a widow's peak as a baby no, I, or something? I wasn't full on Eddie Munster, you know. <laughs> I did, after all, like grow up in a very conservative Cuban family uh, in a very conservative part of New Jersey. So, you know, expressing myself with macabre style was definitely not going to be um accepted but as far back as i can remember i just loved monsters i loved monster movies and we could maybe get super psychological about why that is but we're not going to today (laughs) so um so i already loved vampires and werewolves and all the universal horror movies and just anything i can get my hands on that was you know, horror related, monster related, Halloween related. And then as I start to become a teenager um, and MTV comes along, you know, I was one of those teenagers who sat there for the very first broadcast of MTV were suddenly exposed to all of these different bands and MTV bless their little hearts. um, Didn't exactly show top 40, you know, they had all sorts of alternative bands on there. Uh, So, you know, I start to see David Bowie. And I start to see Susie and the Banshees and the Cure and bands like that. And already having this fascination with the macabre, it was just a natural uh, evolution of, I love stuff that's dark. And now here is this music that really appeals to somebody with macabre sensibilities. But I would have to say like one of the defining moments was at four in the morning or three in the morning, watching a show called Night Flight on my tiny little black and white TV somewhere around 1981, where they would show these music videos from this far off land called England that we knew nothing about. And uh, there was this one video where this man in a tri-cornered hat with warrior makeup in this, you know, elaborate brocade outfit jumps out of a tree 
with two pistols and yells, stand and deliver. And I said, I have no idea who this guy is, but I want to be exactly like him. You know, so that Adam Ant video for stand and deliver was one of those defining moments for me where I saw all of these things that I loved all in one place. You know, there was romanticism, there was darkness, there was macabre, there was the pageantry of the 18th century. There was men wearing makeup, you know, there was androgyny. There was just all of these things collided all in that one moment. Yeah. And uh, here I am many decades later, uh, still dressing like Adam Ann. <laughs> you know, I, I love that you said that. I I just did an interview with uh, John Robb, who, um, you know, is a, a big historian of the goth scene and just wrote a, a book called The History of Goth. Um, and, and talk with him about that, that I, I think it has come full circle in a lot of ways because yes, the music drew a lot of people in in the 80s, but beyond that, it, it really was the safety of being able to go to a club if you were, I don't know, uh, playing around with gender ideas, sexuality, or even just alternative fashion, you know, where like a safe place to go do that were these clubs. And then you heard it and all of a sudden you're like, oh, holy shit, Sisters of Mercy Floodlands is great, you know, and you found the music that way, but a lot of times it really was, you were looking for a place to express that kind of alternative or or dark uh, ideas that you were starting to have. So very cool. Well, I, as I may have said a million years ago in a book I wrote called What is Goth? You know, one of the beautiful things about the goth community is that it redefined entirely or allowed you to redefine entirely what beauty was. Yeah. And I could tell you as somebody who was very bullied and very unpopular in school that I was never going to be winning any popularity contests. I was never going to be voted best looking, you know, um, but you could show up at the goth scene and you could, you know, it didn't matter what body type you had. It had more to do with how passionate you were about the music mm -hmm. and how you dressed, you know, you, you sure. might have, you know, the community that I grew up in was very, very unkind towards basically anybody who didn't fit the mold of normal. So like if you were a guy, you were expected to be muscular, you were expected to be very macho. If you were a girl, you were expected to be like very thin, you know, like body conscious. In, yeah. Um, and and at the goth club, it didn't matter if you were scrawny. It didn't matter if you were heavy set. Like it really didn't matter what your body type was. What, you know, I, I would always say, in rather than being like the king and the queen at the prom at the goth scene there was which was something we were never going to be <laughs> at the goth club there was suddenly opportunity to be the best dancer or the best dressed or the one who looks most like a vampire <laughs> you know there was just all of these other ways to shine which were much more important awards anyway at the end of the day <laughs> I, I agree <laughs> All right. Um, that, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. I, I want to go on now to the other part of it for you specifically. So I kind of alluded in the introduction that hearing and seeing that this should be fun, that there's comedy for it, that it's okay to write a serious song about something serious you're going through and emotions, but humans are complex creatures and we're not all one thing. And most people that I know in the goth scene aren't ultra serious like i mean there's a few of them i'm sure andrew aldrich really does sit around and say all day long serious as fuck but for the most part it isn't that way and you openly and actively made it okay to turn on his head and not just make jokes but make witty intelligent jokes mixed into your music tell me a little bit about how that came to to be what you were known for and why it was important to you to add that aspect into the music that you were playing? Uh, I don't think that there was ever a thought process involved. Um, I, at the time, you know, because this is now going back like three decades, right? Mm -hmm. or, or two and a half decades, yeah, nearly three decades. At the time, I was vastly more acerbic than I am today. I have seriously mellowed with age. <laughs> and a lot of that really comes from finding who you really are and 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 becoming more comfortable in your skin. But yeah. keep in mind that when I first started writing music, you know, in my 20s or mid-20s, 
I was still very, very damaged, very, very broken and very, very bruised from uh, 17, my very first 17 years of my life, yeah. which were a living hell. And I think I, I think I had, I had found a way to survive. Like I had found a way not to kill myself. And that simply was adopting, you know, the same kind of humor that I think a lot of uh, detectives have, you know, detectives who walk into crime scenes and they see things that are unbearable they're just absolutely right. unbearable and they have to come up with ways to like crack a joke about it process or, or that right of it. yeah yeah in order to just like make it through the night and i think i was very much in that space you know when i first started writing music so that's what i wrote about you know i wrote about things that i loved and i wrote about it more or less from the perspective of who i was and how i saw things um and bottom line really is just i've never been a fan of genres uh, so i i fly every weekend of the year so I, I play almost every weekend of the year so i find myself in airports you know with my guitar slung over my shoulder and i'm constantly stopped and people always ask me uh hey are you a musician i say you yes, figured me out yeah you know, like you know there's well this, this isn't a calculator you know it's the, obviously i'm a musician and i say well what genre are you in and I never, ever know how to answer that, you know, because I don't, I can't say I'm gothic. Like if I don't, I don't sound like Bauhaus. Sure. I don't sound like The Cure. You know, I don't sound like a goth band. Um, but I can't really tell them that I'm like Johnny Cash either, because then they might say, oh, he's country, you know. So I have always just felt that genres are like tools. And imagine how terrible it would be to hire a carpenter and say, well, what do you have in your toolbox? And they open it up and there's like, just hammers. Just I only have hammers, which is kind of what it's like to be like a heavy metal guitarist. Like all I have is hammers, you know, or um, yeah, I only have screwdrivers, yeah. uh, which might be what it's like to be like, a, I don't know, like a, a, a rapper, like what, whatever, whatever genre, you have to think of it as a tool. And I, at the end of the day, as pompous as it may sound, don't consider myself a musician. I consider myself a storyteller. I consider my, like, if you look at my songs, you will not find a single song that does not tell a story beginning, middle, right. and end. And as a storyteller, I need to be able to have every tool available to me to be able to tell that story. Now, if it's a story about a bullfighter, you know, fighting the devil for his soul, that song might be a flamenco song. Right. right? Or if it's a story about a zombie in Jamaica, that song might be a reggae song, you know, so yeah. which all, and both of these songs exist. Right. By the way. I know, I know, so I do. <laughs> whatever, you know, genre, genres are, exist to give a musician an opportunity to use whatever colors and whatever feelings and sounds and emotions are going to convey what they're trying to convey through the song. So, um, so yeah, I don't think there was ever a moment where I thought to myself, I'm going to be a gothic comedian. <laughs> I just got out on stage and and here I guess I guess here's the answer. I got out on stage and in, in, instead of deciding to like act as if I was the spookiest goth in town, I just decided to be myself. And that's ultimately I guess the answer to your question is there was no thought process. It was just, I'm out there making music, but I'm very much making it as an individual who's very often sad and very often happy and very often enraged. And, you know, I have the entire spectrum of human emotion and there's no reason why that shouldn't come forth in the art that's made. Yeah, no, I love hearing you say that. And so in addition to kind of doing the review page and the interviews like this, we have a, a really active Facebook group. We have discussions and whatnot. And one of the things I always fear and try and avoid is just that, like the genre discussion, because I've said many times in the same way as somebody who I guess has to categorize music to some level or try and describe what I'm hearing in it, that the only thing genre is good for is if you like band A, you might like band B. Absolutely. And beyond that, it's the stupidest kind of wankery and I have no interest in kind of the minutia of that discussion. I just, I mean, that's what's important to me. That's why I try and make up three or four genres when I'm writing about music a day uh, of whatever I'm hearing that, you know, steampunk Christian grindcore or whatever, you know. Um, well, I'm pretty sure none of the original goth bands call themselves goth bands. No, no, for, for certain. Uh, they hate that actually, for the most part. <laughs> well, I, I always say that I 
am not a musician who makes goth music. I am a musician who's a goth who makes music. <laughs> See, I, I love. I you personally say. identify as gothic, but I don't necessarily make, uh, you know, like I don't make music that sounds like the actors, the boot blacks, vision sure. video, like all of this great new wave of like sort of death rocky sounding goth bands. Yeah. All of which I love, but that's not what I sound like. I probably sound more like you know, what if Johnny Cash was making folk music for vampires? And I think when you said earlier that you think of yourself as a storyteller, first and foremost, that's accurate. I think that's when I hear your music, that's what I love about it is the narrative. I get to go on a journey every time and like reading a book, you know, in the story. And so, no, I I would say closer to, yeah, maybe a, a Shane McGowan or Tom Waits, I would say you're closer to that than I would put you with a Peter Murphy or, a, you know, Andrew Eldritch or something. I think that's more where I relate your music because you're right. It's something that you can't put in a box. Well, when I'm in, when I'm outside of the United States, particularly if I'm in Mexico, people just be like, oh, he's a, he's a troubadour. And I get described as a troubadour a lot. Sure. And and, and I love that, you know, because Bard, right. Troubadour, you know, these are entertainers who were primarily storytellers, but they told their stories through song. You know, so I, I probably I mean, Tom Waits absolutely positively was a direct influence. Like oh. when, when I started recording music, you know, which is funny because I grew up with david bowie and and peter murphy and adam ant and the psychedelic furs and like all these bands bands that sounded like very rock and very 80s yeah but by the time i learned to play the acoustic guitar what am i listening to i'm listening to tom waits i'm listening to rasputina yeah. which was a local a local unsigned band at the time right you know, I'm listening to this ac anachronistic music and I really fell in love with the idea of writing songs that could have come out 400 years ago or 300 years ago. I really loved the idea of of making sort of anachronistic music. And that's kind of where it all got started, I guess. What could be more goth than something that would be played around a fire while you're sacking Rome? I mean, Absolutely. that's goth. <laughs> right. All right. Before we... Uh... I'm having too much fun. I, I just get chattering. I want to get to something important that you did recently that came out. And there uh, is the album that you've just put out, The Black Labyrinth. And my wife and I, Rachel, uh, we just went uh, in Grand Rapids. They had a exhibit uh, at the Museum of Art there of Jim Henson through the years of all kind of the things he, and had a lot of the puppets there you could see in videos, super freaking cool. One of them, we walk into this room and it had the song playing uh, and had the original outfit that Bowie wore and Sarah wore in the movie wow. Labyrinth. And is the playing as the world falls down as the world falls down is playing in this little room. And then the puppets, the ones that were actual puppets in her bedroom at the end of the movie that like you saw that came to life as the puppets and the thing, but the, and she just started bawling. And I mean, it, it hit me too. I mean, that movie was a big emotional deal for a lot of people you talk about nostalgia that stays with you years later that movie is one of those and you put out this beautiful emotive incredible album that was homage and then also had so many musicians that were a part of this and tell me a little bit about how this came together and where this idea came from and why it was important in 2022 to put forth this into the world. Uh, well, it, it 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 starts not in 2022, but in 2020 in 2016. Oh, because in 2016, uh, David Bowie died. Right. He was my number one musical hero. I mean, I from the moment I saw David Bowie in the eighties, I thought this is the coolest human being who ever lived. And I want to be just like him. And I and think what's so amazing is you saying that me saying that 
a generation after me, a generation before you. This is a guy who was that for five decades through five different cutting edges of music. Yeah. He wasn't just like the Rolling Stones playing the same thing for 50 years or whatever. He was the cutting edge of glam, industrial, psychedelic, new wave, the cutting edge of all of it. Well, I mean, uh, since you brought it up, I discovered David Bowie in the 80s. And at the same time, I'm seeing Bauhaus for the first time. I'm seeing Adam and the Ants for the first time. I'm seeing Psychedelic Furs. So all of these men, right, were my role models, right? David Bowie, Peter Murphy, Adam Ant, Richard Butler of the Furs, et cetera, et cetera. And then as I start to get older and I start to make music and I start to meet some of these guys and even work with some of these guys, um, I was so shocked, especially having a conversation with Richard Butler of the Psychedelic Furs. He was a neighbor of mine and I'd go have cheese soup at his place like three nights a week. <laughs> and so I was I was sitting there one day and it just like occurred to me and I was like, Richard, you know, I, David Bowie was like my big hero growing up. Like, who, who was your hero? And he said, David Bowie. <laughs> and, and then you know Gary Newman tells me the same thing and then Adam Ant says and then you know Peter Murphy said and I sud suddenly start to realize like David Bowie was not just my hero he was the hero of my heroes right he was he was the hero of all of us and so I will never ever forget where I was and what I was doing the moment I heard that David Bowie died in 2000. 16 which i was in a goth club um it was a goth party called procession and i was sitting at the bar by myself i used to go there and like i was maybe not having the best year sure and i'd go there and drown my sorrows next to this taxidermied coyote and it would just be me and the coyote drinking and i suddenly look up and through the fog i see everyone's crying and i mean grown men are being consoled by their partners and i thought oh my god what happened and i get on my phone and i suddenly discover that something truly tragic had occurred and that we had lost david bowie and i kind of kept it together but i went home and then i didn't i didn't keep it together anymore once i was home and i cried quite a lot and i knew right at that moment that i wanted to create some kind of homage to david bowie now, of course, when anybody wants to make an homage to a musician, they typically do like an album of covers. That was something I knew I didn't want to do because me creating like B-rate versions of his amazing songs is not a tribute. It's just like, I just don't see that as a tribute. I wanted to do something else. So I had this idea to create a Requiem. And when I say Requiem, I mean like Mozart's Requiem Mass for the Dead level classical piece with a choir and an orchestra. And I start writing it. And the first movement is called The King is Dead. So as I'm working on The King is Dead, but in the moment I thought King and David Bowie in the same sentence, I thought Goblin King. Okay. And that's when I realized that instead of doing this straightforward Requiem to David Bowie, that I would do a musical inspired by Labyrinth that kind of picks up like after the death of the Goblin King, which sadly happened in real life. What I never predicted was that I would end up recording it with 15 members of David Bowie's band. <laughs> that was a surprise to me. So again, I'm going to, I'm going to collect. Tell me a little bit about that, because to me, that's part of what made this specially important because it would have been really easy. Like you said, to all of us were impacted by David Bowie and and to try and make music that kind of came at that from that concept from the outside thing. But the fact that you were able to draw in so many people that were directly touched in their lives by knowing him and make them a part of this process. What was that like? And just in general, going into work every day for a while with these guys. I mean, not directly fit because the world now we can all just send each other zip files. But, you know, what was that like getting to work hand in hand with people who did the same process of songwriting 
with Bowie himself. Well, I mean, a lo- the great majority of it was in person. So I was going to the studio and recording with, you know, the drummer Sterling Campbell and and uh, Mark Platy, who produced Earthling uh, and played bass and guitar on a million of Bowie's records and tours. Um, uh, Steve Elson, the saxophone player from Let's Dance, you know, like all I, I did work in person with a great majority of them. Um, but and and I wish that I could tell you that I'm a genius and that I thought I'm going to make a sequel to Labyrinth and you know I'm going to record it with 15 <laughs> members of David Bowie's band. But it just it just didn't work out that way. It was an accident. It happened, honest to God, organically and if not accidentally. And it really just all springs from me looking for a drummer. So I'm about to start this massive, massive 20 song project. And of course, I'd written all the songs already, and I was ready to start recording drums. And um, I had been working on several albums in a row with Brian Viglione, the drummer from Dresden Dolls. Yeah, he had, moved, he had moved out to like he recorded on he recorded all the drums on maybe like six of my albums. Mm-hmm. But then he had moved out to the West Coast, and I needed somebody in New York. And I get this crazy idea, and it's just that it's a crazy idea. Like, what if? Sterling Campbell, who played with Bowie on a great many albums, played the drums on this, right? Now, I met Sterling once in 1990 when he was with Duran Duran. And um, I'm so dumb. And this is true. I'm like, I'm not really, this isn't like self-defecating, self-defecating humor. This isn't self-deprecating humor. Like, I'm honestly so dumb that... I will get an idea and I won't realize how ridiculous it is. If it excites me, I have a very childlike way of looking at things. And if it excites me, I'll go for it. You know? Yeah. So I get this idea. I met him once. I was invited to his home for a, a party he had in 1990. And I was like, I'm going to reach out to this guy. And so I write to him, you know, I'm like, hi, Sterling, it's Voltaire. I met you once in 1990. Uh, I'm re- making this record. And I'm wondering if you would be willing to come in and record some drum tracks. And he writes back to me. And like, uh, honestly, I'll never know if he actually remembered me or not. But he was like, oh, hey, Voltaire, good to hear from you. You know, and he said, you know, truth be told. He was at that point the drummer for the B-52s. Mm-hmm. And it was during festival season that I wrote to him. But because of the pandemic, like myself, he had no concerts like like the rest of us musicians. Mm-hmm. He just had no shows. And he was like, I'm sitting around. Every I'd time. Love, yeah, I'd love to come in and record something. So he comes in and we recorded four or five songs in a couple of days. And uh, when he was done, he said, what are you doing next? And I was like, well, I guess next I'm going to record bass. And I asked him, I was like, you have any recommendations? He's like, well, why don't you work with Gail Ann Dorsey? You know, Bowie's bass player. <laughs> I don't know Gail Ann Dorsey. You know, I'm not, I'm not famous. I can't just read. Who do you think I am? (laughs) Exactly. He's like, well, well, I know we're all caller and I'll ask her. So the next thing I know I'm recording with Gail and it was, you know, that like, you know, she might've asked at some point, like, who's, who's playing guitar on this. You should get Earl Slick. And then I'm worked. And and it was like a snowball effect of one musician referring me to another musician. More importantly, referring me to them. You know, because there was almost there there was nary a session where the musician I was working with didn't turn to me and didn't say something like, you know, I just want you to know I'm only here because, uh, you know, Earl Slick told me that that this record was cool. (laughs) You know, so it was this like, whatever, I'll take it. (laughs) Yeah, it was like this inner circle. Really, it was like the inner circle of Bowie's musicians coming in, recording, presumably having a good experience. And reaching out to another one of the musicians and saying, you should, yeah, I should go record with this cat. Yeah. And at the end of the day, there was 15 members of Bowie's band that recorded on the record. And I got to tell you, by the end, like I might have gotten a little cocky by the end. <laughs> it was like, I, I think one of the last songs I recorded was As the World Falls Down. Mm-hmm. And I had already worked with uh, Earl Slick, who was a guitarist that started with Bowie around Diamond Dogs. And I had worked with, uh, you know, Jerry Leonard, who probably started working with uh, Bowie around like the next day or, you know, sort of latter day Bowie, if you will. Um, And I'd worked with both of them and recorded a whole bunch of stuff. And when it came time to record uh, guitars for 
as the world falls down, I was like, neither one of them was available. So I was like, oh no, like who's going to play guitar on these songs? I was like, well, who played guitar on the original? <laughs> you know, and it was a guitarist by the name of Nicky Maroc. And I reached out to him and I was like, hey, I'm making this record. Would you be interested? So the original guitarist from the original version, yeah. as the world falls down, plays on this. As does the bass player from the original version, now Ertel Kazilke, who who wrote and and demoed all of the Labyrinth album with Bowie, uh, you know, played bass on that song as well. So, you know, by the end it got almost like a, it, it, you know, it was like who else can I get in on this, right? There was another example that there's a song that sounds a lot like Modern Love, and it's kind of like one of the Easter eggs. There's a lot of Easter eggs on this album. One of the Easter eggs happens to be that the song I Laugh in the Face of Death has the same exact chord structure as, as Modern Love. And uh, recording backing vocals for that one. And again, we're like towards the end of recording this record. And I was like, who sang backing vocals on Modern Love? And it was a gentleman by the name of Frank Sims. So I reached out to Frank and he came in and recorded. So like by the end, like this snowball got pretty big it was a lot of fun it was really really an incredible experience to be honest it's so funny to hear you say that too because doing a lot of these interviews and talking to people i feel like when the pandemic hit this was the reoccurring theme for everybody that no matter who you were what you were working at shoot your shot like reach out because there were so many people that you thought were unattainable that were chilling in their apartment and everybody has a home studio now and why not ask and i swear i've i've had this story so many times from people just like that where they're like oh what the hell like i, I might as well shoot an email and see if anybody was and there they were or sometimes i reach out to my friend ethan who says hey ken would you want to do an interview with voltaire and i'm like yes yes please <laughs> Well, and you know what you just said to me, Ethan. That was a big deal. Do you know? <laughs> I wonder. I mean, I'm 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 glad that we could uh, sort it. Um, above and beyond these musicians being available because of the pandemic, you know, I still probably wouldn't have been able to have afforded them if it sure. weren't for the pandemic. But during the pandemic, all the bars were closed, and I probably saved tens of thousands of dollars that I well, would have been I mean, throwing away in bars. Kind of like we went back to though. Look getting these guys on the horn is one thing but you still had to write not just something of quality of that level not just that told a story like labyrinth did you know which was a captivating movie but a fantasy tale you know that like through ages you know kids now i have shown you know young people that or me when i was a kid you know 40 years ago and I think the other part is it had to a be that captivating, but b be true to Bowie's vision, because if if these people had heard it and they didn't feel like it was up to snuff, it wouldn't have happened, you know. And when I heard this, that's just it. It wasn't just a cover. I was back in the story. It was a continuation of the story, but that same feeling. And I was that same 11, 12 year old kid again, seeing it and feeling it. And, and I think that was the real power of this and why everybody, if you haven't yet, needs to go listen to this album, especially if you were a fan of Labyrinth. Like it, it is transportive in that same fantasy way. Um, I, I also know that to support this and play along with it, you're going to go back out on the road. Um, tell me a little bit about that coming up and where people can see you. Yeah, I've never not been on the road, <laughs> but um, I, I played 40 cities last you year. You're truly so, a bard, sir. <laughs> yeah, so because I'm because I'm a solo musician... I have the luxury of being able to get on an airplane on a Friday and go and play Los Angeles that night and be home Saturday, you know, which you can't really do when you have a full band, you know, and you have like, flying five or six people everywhere. Um, it's it might be prohibitively expensive, but being a solo artist, I luckily can do that. So I, I have like not done a traditional tour in probably 
maybe seven years at this point, like getting in a vehicle and going from city to city. At least you don't have to use your toes there. Huh? Well, you were counting on your fingers, I saw. Oh, yeah. Right. Yes, it wasn't right, right. It wasn't more than 10. <laughs> that was... uh, yeah, yeah. I didn't quite get up to 10, luckily. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, so like I, I, almost every weekend of the year, I get on a plane, I go somewhere and I perform and I come back. So like last year, I played 40 cities. This year, I intend for it to be a minimum of 50. <laughs> so... There's a lot of shows coming up and this this tour, which started last month in Mexico City, and it's called the King of Villains Tour. The King of Villains is the villain song from the Black Labyrinth, which uh, quotes a whole bunch of Disney villains, as a matter <laughs> of fact. Um, this tour started in Mexico City and then I played St. Louis and then I played New York. And there's by the end of it, there will be, I think, roughly 50 cities spanning mexico the united states the uk and europe so i'm very very much looking forward to it yeah and uh while i play some of the black labyrinth mm -hmm. you know i play a couple of songs from the black labyrinth and uh i'm mostly focusing on as the in the king of villains tour uh, the fact that I'm known for villain songs right from the very beginning from my very first album when you're evil yeah which I don't know how I feel. I don't know how, how I feel about the fact that my most popular song came out in 1998. You know, like it literally is a song on my first album that's either amazing or terrible. I'm not sure which, but I'm just thankful that there's a song people like. Um, I mean, I'll say all these years later, I, I think I could probably sing every song on that uh, album. And I'll admit, I probably haven't listened to it in a hot minute, but that's how much they stuck with me. So well, thank you. I mean, I had no idea what I was doing. So the fact that like people like them is wonderful and, and shocking. But uh, yeah, that song, When You're Evil, kind of started out like it, it's a celebration. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of like a very theatrical feeling yeah. celebration of, of villainy. And um, and then, you know, the next thing I know, I'm I'm writing villain songs for Cartoon Network and uh, and now there's this viral um, series of animated videos by Daria Cohen, the vampire series. And I say that because it's like a, it's called a vampire because it's a pair of vampires, <laughs> like this kind of like love hate relationship between these two vampires. And she has animated, um, I think at this point, six or seven of my songs. The first one being The Night, which has 50 million views on on uh, YouTube now, which is another one of those things that we were talking earlier about how, you know, 22 years ago, I, I write this song for Cartoon Network and the listeners were eight. And now they all come to the shows. Well, at this point, like some six, seven, eight years ago, Daria Cohen makes an animated vid video for my song The Night, which gets millions and millions of views which was probably being watched primarily by kids or teenagers, mm -hmm. you know, who like loved Japanese animation. And that's probably what they were doing, watching these animated videos. And now they're all coming to the shows too. So it's, um, you know, I don't remember what the question was anymore because now I'm just rambling like a fool. Well, we were talking about, you know, where people could see you going out on tour. I, uh, and hopefully we're going to talk after this about trying to add in a Detroit show. Absolutely. Yeah. We talked earlier uh, before the interview about how I haven't played in Detroit. It's this video, this this tour, uh, I, I did a tour. And in fact, it was with Ego Likeness. And it was a million years ago. And it was called the Forgotten Cities Tour. And I made it a point to go play in cities that I just wasn't getting booked in regularly, like Detroit and Pittsburgh and San Diego. And there's like a whole bunch of cities that for whatever. Oh, Houston's another one. I play in Dallas five times a year, but no one will ever book me in Houston. So, um, I mean, three of those cities you call that have great goth scenes. So, you yeah, know, I mean, I, you know, look, I, Vancouver's an example of a city up in Canada that I used to go and play. But if there was like an EBM night next door, no one came to my show, you know, because like <laughs> the goth scene was like entirely made up of people who put on big stompy boots and had yarn hair. And well, the actors was... brought it back for you now. So they're What's ready that? for you. I said the actors brought it back for you. So they're ready for you again now. 
Well, that could be that could be true. But in any case, I guess the point is that there's no telling why some cities, you know, like I, I play L.A. every single year, Dallas every single year, Austin every single year, New Orleans every single year. There's like a bunch of cities where I'm guaranteed to play. So on this tour, I'm kind of heading back to that philosophy of the Forgotten Cities tour of trying to book those places that I typically have not played, you know, so. Right. While I'm still going to play in Dallas and Los Angeles and Austin and 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 uh, New Orleans and all the usual suspects, Chicago, which had kind of fallen off the map, is a, a stop on the tour. Houston, for the first time in years, is a stop on the tour. I'm working on Charlotte. I just booked Indianapolis. You know, so I'm really making a point to try to get back to those places that I haven't performed in a long time. Nice. Were you playing? Were you playing villainy. in Indianapolis? What's that? Uh, were you playing in Indianapolis at the uh, Black Circle? That's the one. Black nice. Circle. Very cool venue. Great yeah. empanadas. Oh, good to know. <laughs> they do homemade empanadas there. They're very good. All right. So we've been talking. So I knew I was going to do this. I was going to ramble on. But there's two more things that I want to touch on. The first one is going to be quick. Uh, me and my friends get together and we have this ritual that we call bad movie brunch on Sundays where, oh uh, you know, my bass player and guitar player and our partners and get together and we watch the worst possible movies. And then I, you know, make mimosas and a big brunch. Um, one of them that I saw recently that we did was called Velocipaster. And I'm watching this film. And I look up and I swear to God, is that you? Yeah, yeah. I'm You're in, in the movie, Velo I'm, that was you. I'm in Velocipaster. Wow. I play uh, an exorcist. And yes. when I asked the director, I was like, what's my character's name? He said, Altair. I was like, <laughs> I said, You're not even trying. <laughs> so, yeah, so I, I'm in Velocipaster. Wow. So that was a quick one. And Go check out Velocity. It was a great one. That was uh, right up there with one of our favorites, uh, None of That, uh, which is uh, another mm -hmm. favorite cheesy bad movie brunch one. Um, wow. I, I feel like I could keep doing this forever, but we're coming up to the part in the interview uh, where we are a music review page, uh, first and foremost. And I always like to ask artists, what out there is inspiring you? And we've talked a little bit about, you know, say like Vision Video and Dusty and, you know, but, and I'll give a shout out to one here that I know a friend of yours, Black Rose Burning, uh, George Grant, uh, who I know has done production work with you and uh, is, is uh, you know, New York guy as well. Um, and one of my favorite, I always say, uh, is like the goth Peter Gabriel is what I think of as the uh, new Black Rose Burning album. Just sure. absolutely incredible stuff. And songs about Dune, where when I did the interview with George, we ended up spending, I think, 26 minutes of it talking about the Dune books and Frank Herbert. <laughs> so do you have anybody, any artists now that you're hearing or listening to that you want to give a shout out that you feel are inspiring you? Well, I, ironically, I was going to recommend um, his band as well. Black Rose you can. Burning. You you can do so that. There you I go. So I, I, I am also going to recommend Black Rose Burning. Um, I think that first album is really impressive. You know, just like it's 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 full of hooks. I mean, it's just like yeah. full of hits. It, it really is like I, I find myself humming or singing a lot of those songs, even when they're not on um you know so and then obviously this the follow-up is a great album as well but um yeah that's a band that i would highly recommend uh i would i would recommend checking out both of those albums i don't listen to a lot of music which you might find very strange for me to say but i here i am at the lair voltaire and you don't hear any music in the background if you're here at any other moment of the day you won't hear any music in the background i almost never listen to music I think because we live in this world that's so saturated with noise and music and and sure. music and you know you can't walk into a store without them playing something that when I'm at home I tend to just sit in silence yeah. with my thoughts doing whatever it is that I'm doing. So now do you want to uh, change it up then because I'll also well, accept if there's a 
a show, a movie, or a book. No, 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 no. I, no. Oh, no, you got this? Me. Okay. I'm, right. I, I'm getting to a point here. I'm just very long-winded. <laughs> so, uh, so I don't, I, I'm not the kind of person who discovers music. I'm just not that, I don't discover music sitting at home. I just don't. Yeah. But I'll tell you where I do discover great music, and that is on the road. So very often when I, when I play somewhere, I have no control over the opening acts, right? Because yeah. the local promoter or the venue, they should figure out who they think is a good fit and who, who they think has a good draw. And so I leave it to them. I have no, I have nothing to do with who the opening act is. And once in a while, I will find myself going, these guys are really good. Yeah. Like they better get out of this town good, right? And I had that experience, uh, I'm going to say two or three years ago with Rose Garden Funeral Party. Great so band. that's a great band. I, now, I played with them in Portland. I had no idea where they were from. Um, well, they're apparently from Dallas. They are. But I bought two of their CD. I might have bought three of their CDs, like one for me and two to give away. Like that's how good I thought they were. And um, And then I've subsequently run into them a couple of times when I've played in Dallas but uh, I don't know if I'm supposed to be announcing this because it's really not on the books yet, but I'm almost entirely certain they're going to be supporting me on the UK tour. Oh, that's so awesome. I look forward to hearing them every night for a week in the UK. And if you haven't heard them yet, I strongly recommend you check them out. Rose Garden Funeral Party. I think they're really great. I think they sound kind of like a cross between like old, you know, like original blondie like classic blondie yeah. motels you know i i think they have a really really great sound and a phenomenal uh, lead singer yeah and their their singer is just a powerful voice that's what it kind of reminds me of and i always say say it kind of has like a like gothier stevie nicks like fleetwood mac kind of vibe almost because yeah. it is very rock like right. their sound is very they they're putting the rock back in gothic rock it's it's a rock band first and foremost that just happens to have these very dark themes and kind of tones you know I, and i think that's so important you know i mean like look i i this is coming from a folk ish satirical gothic crooner right yeah so i'm obviously in my own really weird little corner of the goth scene but I think, you know, there's a lot of bands coming out now that have this like very straightforward, very, very kind of specific goth rock sound. And I love that stuff. But, you know, we need those other bands that sound yeah. like Blondie, you know, that, that sound like Devo, that sound like The Cure, you know, just, just like all these different to bring us back to the original beauty of the goth scene, which is that you could put on 10 gothic records and maybe have 10 completely different musical experiences, which I really love that about this this uh, scene, if you will. I've gotten to the point where, because I don't want to argue with people about what goth means anymore, I, I've come where I just call it dark scene. And, and I think that's a lot easier for people to digest because of how much things have splintered and gone into their own subsects and whatnot. So beautiful, two great recommendations there. So this has been a true delight. We're, we're coming up to the end here. Um, here at Sounds and Shadows, we always like to spin out uh, to one of your new songs on the new album. And I kind of want to ask you, if someone is hearing this record for the first time, what is the track that you think really encapsulates the the theme or the impetus of the uh the black labyrinth and what is that track so that we can and you can set it up like i'm johnny carson here like what's the clip that we're going to be hearing next um and we will spin out to the song so that people can enjoy it uh well unfortunately my answer is it's it's two different answers so i hope you're going to allow me to give you two Go ahead. Do, do your thing because the song that i personally feel encapsulates black labyrinth more than any other song would be oubliette and the title itself kind of gives it away right because the yeah. oubliette is is a thing that's mentioned you know time and time and again to be forgotten in the exactly in the, in the original film of labyrinth and i always say that oubliette is the labyrinthiest of all of the songs on labyrinth because it has this kind of like 80s bowie sound that's 
supplied by the fact that it's the musicians from 80s, you know, 80 era Bowie right. records. Um, but above and beyond that, there's a lot of references to the original story. So if you're looking for a song that's going to make you go, oh, yeah, this is kind of like living in the same world as Labyrinth, I'd say Oubliette. However, I would probably suggest King of Villains, because <laughs> King of Villains is probably the most epic song on the Black Labyrinth, in my opinion. Well, I enjoy both. But you know what? I'll I'll go the King of Villains because... It, for the tour name, for everything else, let's spin out to that because it is a freaking bop. So, from us here at Sounds and Shadows, uh, this has been a true pleasure with one of my musical heroes, uh, Voltaire. It has been great talking to you, and I look forward to either seeing you in Chicago or Detroit, if I can uh, pull some strings here. And please, everyone go check out this album and appreciate it for what it is. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. So it's a real pleasure to be on board. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, the Chicago show is definitely happening. So hopefully I'll see you there March 31st at Cobra Lounge. And if not, who knows? Maybe there'll be a Detroit show who knows? as well. From us here at Sounds and Shadows, keep it dark, y'all. said I was evil. What did you think that meant? It didn't mean that I was naughty or haughty or slightly irreverent. When I said I was evil, what did you think that implied? That I'm careless with the truth? How uncouth? Dear God, did you think I lied when someone says they're evil? It's best to believe, like the skull on that poison vial you see. A symbol so primeval, it's not there to deceive. It's there to let you know it's deadly, just like me. When you're truly evil, it's so much fun. It's kind of like a game where some get maimed while you look out for number one. When you're truly evil, you don't care what people think. They might as well be drenched in stench. Cause all opinions take a hyena as the flesh of another living being. He does not repent, nor lament. It's the way he was meant to be. And a lion is defense with the deadliest of means. She might do it for the thrill of the kill or whatever fulfills her needs Nowadays everyone's a villain so it seems and they strut around the town wearing black and they're called misunderstood when in fact they're merely good It's villain credentials that they lack And unlike me they've got no scars upon their backs you see, I was born in the full moon's light When I emerged that made the angels cry With a heart that's black as stone And when I was fully grown Well, I was betrothed to the night And in time, I'll make that girl in black my bride That's why you can trust in me just in me Cause I've got friends on the other side You poor unfortunate souls Your diamonds in the rough And now with your permission I'm going to do my stuff Silence! No one can deny it. What I do, I am the best When this hellfire, this dark fire I spill As a specimen, why? It's intimidating, yes. 
If this don't scare you, no evil thing will So let's sound the drums of war It's like music in the air It's time to follow me, so be prepared Oh, c'est la vie, mon ami Black sorcery is my dish of tea You've got to let it go My power flurries through the air The bats in the darkest caves And the skeletons in their graves The creatures of the night Will know my name Oh, the tributes and the praise The obeisance they'll pay At last I will have the fame I crave And as the king of villains I will reign Now that you know that I'm evil What will you do? Well, if you're also evil, you little weevil, you'll do what's right for you. Now that you know that I'm evil, would you turn me in? Don't you know snitches get stitches? Cause snitching is a sin. The night is full of villains, and the villains need a king. But to get ahead, you need an edge. And I've got just the thing with an army of shadows. And the night as my bride, as the king of villains. I will rise As the king of villains I will rise The king of villains Will rise